well, this is it. <laughs> it's getting down to crunch time, right? I mean, counting today, you just have six more shopping days until Christmas. And I know that some of you have maybe had your gifts for a few weeks now. Some of you have maybe had them purchased uh, for a few months now. It seems like every year it's right about this time when I start thinking about what it is that I want to give Mary But I want to tell you that this year I've got it in the bag. Because I got her gifts a couple of months ago. And so I'm feeling pretty proud of myself. If I don't say so myself, right? And so I'm, I, I'm telling you, I'm feeling pretty good about Saturday because I've had those gifts for a little while now. Now, I don't like to rap. I can't rap. I don't want to rap. And so I may have had those gifts for a couple of months, but I may have also asked our 13-year-old son to rap them for me, okay? I mean, I'm just telling you the truth here, all right? But that's kind of the fun of Christmas, right? You get up and you unwrap all these gifts that you get during uh, Christmas time. And this is what we've been doing in our series, our Christmas series this year that we're calling uh, Overcrowded at Christmas. We basically have just been unwrapping some of the details uh, in Luke chapter 2. And we're going to continue to do that this morning. So if you brought your Bible with you and you want to turn to Luke chapter 2, I'd love for you to do that. We're going to go there one more time and we're going to unwrap some more of the details uh, surrounding the birth of Jesus. And we're just going to take some time this morning and we're going to talk about this great opportunity that we're given during this Christmas season. We're given a great opportunity because of Jesus. And so we're going to unwrap some more of the details. Now, we're going to look at a couple of the verses that we looked at last week, but then we're also going to look at some new ones this week, and we're just going to talk about some things that we can do to make sure that we don't miss this great opportunity, and then when we're finished this morning, we'll be done unwrapping a part of Luke chapter 2, all right? And so we're going to start at verse 11, and when we get to verse 11, Jesus has been born there in Bethlehem. And you've got these shepherds, the lowest of the lower class, these guys that are dirty, they, they stink, they smell like sheep because they just spend huge amounts of time with sheep. They're out on the outskirts of Bethlehem and they're in the fields doing what they've done a million times before. They're just watching over their sheep. And while they're watching their sheep, there's this angel that appears to them. And so look at what happens in verse 11. Here's what the angel says. The angel says, today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. So in other words, they saw Jesus. They recognized Jesus. I want you to hold that thought, okay? When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Now, last Sunday, as we were unwrapping some of the details in Luke 2, we took a look at what was happening with the shepherds. And I want to look at the shepherds again this morning because I, I think there's still something that we can learn uh, from the shepherds. And, and I think what we learned this morning from the shepherds is we are given this great opportunity to see Jesus. We're given this great opportunity to recognize Jesus during this Christmas season. Now in this series that we have been calling Overcrowded at Christmas, what we've been doing is we've just been talking about some things that we need to do to make sure that we don't set Jesus off to the side, that we don't leave Jesus out of our Christmas. And so this morning, I just want to take a few moments and I want to talk about some things that I think we need to do to make sure that we don't miss this great opportunity that we're given this morning uh, to, to, to see Jesus, to recognize Jesus. And so uh, there's going to be some notes on the big screen behind me. If you want to jot those down, feel free to do that. There's also a message outline in the RCC app if you prefer to follow along that way as well. All right, so let's just kind of dive in. If we don't want to miss the opportunity to see Jesus, then we need to hurry off. If we want to see Jesus this Christmas, then we need to hurry off. This angel here in Luke chapter 2, he invites the shepherds to go into Bethlehem and see the baby Jesus. And so after there's this invitation from the shepherds, I want you to, or from the angel to the shepherds, I want you to see what the shepherds do. Go back to the text and look at verse 15. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So understand, they have chosen to go into Bethlehem. This is their decision to go and see Jesus, all right? Now look at what Luke says. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby 
who was lying in the manger. So Luke says that the shepherds hurried off. And if you take a look at the wording that Luke uses there, he gives us this picture that these shepherds had this really deep desire to see Jesus. It's almost like they have this sense of urgency, like they're frantic, right? Like they're just going to make sure that they don't miss this opportunity. They are going to go and see Jesus. Now, if you're here this morning... And you have not surrendered your heart and life to Jesus. You don't have a relationship with Jesus. This is the opportunity that you're being given this morning. You have this opportunity to hurry off and go to Jesus and have your life changed forever. Because here's the thing. God sent his one and only son, Jesus, right? I mean, he loves you so much. He wants to spend forever with you. So he sends his one and only son, Jesus, to save you from your sin. I mean, somebody's got to pay for your sin. There's a punishment for your sin. There's a price to be paid for your sin. And so either you're going to pay it or somebody else is going to pay it. And so God sends his one and only son, Jesus, to, to, in, in that manger all those years ago to ultimately do one thing, and that's to give his life on the cross for you. He pays the penalty. He pays the price for your sin and for my sin. And so now what you have to do this morning is you've got to be willing to accept that. And when you accept that, you're saved. You have this hope of eternal life. And so this is the opportunity that maybe some of you are being given this morning, all right? And I want to make sure that you don't miss this opportunity. And I want to make sure that you don't miss this opportunity because of what the Bible says. I want you to look at what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. Listen to this carefully. Because Jesus has gone to the cross for you, here's what Paul says. He says, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue, every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So in other words, there is a day that is coming when all of us, right? Every one of us sitting in this room, every one of us tuning in online, there's a day that's coming when every member of the human race is going to bow before Jesus And every member of the human race is going to acknowledge with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. And we can either do that now in joyful faith, or we can do that later on in resentment and despair because it'll be too late. I mean, this is what is going to happen. Every knee is going to bow, and every tongue is going to confess, acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. And you can either do that now or you can do that later. And so I don't want you to miss the opportunity to do this now. And so we're going to talk about this opportunity a little bit later on. But for some of you, maybe that's the opportunity that you're being given today. Now, many of us who are in this room, we made that decision in joyful faith, right? We we bowed before Jesus. We acknowledged that he is the Lord. And so do you realize now that at any moment, any moment, morning, noon, dinner time, 3 a.m., at any moment, you can go to Jesus. You can hurry off and find Jesus. You know, my family's facing some difficult things right now. And one of the things that I've been learning as I've worked through these last few weeks is that I hold on to so many things for my own security. I mean, one of the things that I've learned over the last few weeks is that, that I hold on to way too much stuff that keeps me from going to Jesus. And over these last three or four weeks, God has just kind of stripped all that away. He's just kind of taken some of that away. You know, there's a song that we sing here at RCC that says, If more of you means less of me, then take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything. I don't know how many times I've sung that song here. But that song has a completely different meaning right now. Because over the last three or four weeks, God has stripped some of that away. God has taken some of those things away. And I only wish that I didn't have to be this overwhelmed. I only wish that I didn't have to be this this broken. I only wish that I didn't have to feel this helpless to where I get to this point that I go before Jesus in this very real an honest way, and I simply say, Jesus, I can't do this anymore. I need you right now. And so what I have learned over these last few weeks and what I would love for you to learn is that you've got to be willing to let go of what you think is providing you your security, and you've just got to go to Jesus. You've got to hurry off and find him. You know, in the New Testament, 
In Philippians chapter 2, we read that passage just a moment ago that says that every knee will bow, every tongue will acknowledge, confess that Jesus is Lord. And in that same passage there in Philippians 2, Paul tells us that Jesus makes himself nothing, that he makes himself nothing, he becomes a servant, he goes to the cross, and he gives his life for you and for me. And what we need to understand is that Jesus made himself nothing so that he can give us everything, right? He made himself nothing so that he can give us everything that we would ever need. Look at what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 8. He says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And so this is what I'm learning. My riches and my security are not found in the things that I hold on to as I live my life here on earth. My riches and my security are found when I go to Christ, because he's all that I need, and he gives me all that I need. And so I would love for us to just be real honest here for just a second, all right? And understand that I'm not asking anyone, asking anyone to stand up and make an announcement. I don't want anyone to, you know, stand up and say anything. But I want you to think about this for just a second. What is it that maybe you have brought in here this morning? What sort of new journey maybe that you find yourself on or your family finds yourself on this new journey? But what have you carried in here today and you've done everything, everything that you know to do except to truly and earnestly go to Jesus. And I want to make sure you understand this, okay? I'm not trying to send you on a guilt trip here. Because I've been there and I've done that over the last three or four weeks. I've been there and I've done that for a a, a large part of my life. I mean, there have been moments when I have been pretty impressed by my own strength. There have been moments where I've stood my own ground. There have been moments where I thought that I could control it all. And what I've learned over these last three or four weeks is that I've got to go to Jesus and say, I can't do this anymore, Jesus. I need you right now. See, this is the opportunity that we're given. We're given this opportunity to hurry off and go to Jesus. And so perhaps now I understand how the shepherds felt when they hurried off. They're urgent. They're frantic. They have this deep desire to see Jesus. And so whatever it is that you carried in here today, whatever it is that maybe you're holding on to, and I don't know what that is, right? You do. I don't. But whatever it is that you've carried in here today, don't be impressed by your own strength. And don't try to stand your own ground. And I'm just going to tell you right up front, okay? You can't handle it all. And so just hurry off and go to Jesus and say, I need you, Jesus. I cannot do this anymore. What a great opportunity we're being given during this Christmas season to hurry off and go to Jesus. And so I think that's the first thing that we need to do if we want to make sure that we don't miss this opportunity. We've got to hurry off. Secondly, we need to spread the word. I think we can see Jesus when we spread the word about him. You know, I'm so fascinated with this next part of the text. Just about every year, not every year, but almost every year, when we go through our Christmas series here at RCC, we usually end up in Luke 2 at some point in time, right? Because, I mean, Luke 2 tells us about the birth of Jesus, gives us all these details surrounding the birth of Jesus. And so many times we find ourselves in Luke 2 before the series is over. So I've studied Luke 2 a lot, I've preached through Luke 2 a lot, and I'm always fascinated with this next part of the text. Because I just love what these shepherds do. These shepherds are the only ones who are invited to go and see Jesus. So they go and see him. And then I want you to see what Luke says they do. They, they, Luke just simply says they take off and they begin to share about Jesus. Look at verse 17. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Now I think there's a couple of things that we need to kind of talk through here just to make sure that we understand this. All right, First of all... You've got the shepherds here in Luke chapter 2 who are face to face with Jesus. They're invited to go into Bethlehem. They go into Bethlehem. They find themselves there at the manger. And they they find this baby that's wrapped in cloths just like the angel said. And so they're face to face with Jesus. These guys that are the lowest of the lower class. These guys who are dirty and they stink. They smell like sheep. I mean, you heard me say that several times last week. And you've heard me say that a couple times already this morning. The other thing that you've heard me say last week and this morning, is that no one trusts them. Back in Jesus' day, 
shepherds weren't even allowed to give testimony in a court of law. If they gave a testimony in a court of law, then it was automatically thrown out. So in other words, understand here, okay, these shepherds, the foregone conclusion about shepherds is that they're pathological liars. And so nobody trusts them. And so you have these dirty, smelly, stinky guys that nobody trusts. They're the lowest of the lower class. And these are the ones who are face to face with Jesus. It doesn't make any sense, right? They're not good enough to be there at the manger with Jesus. And everybody's given up on them. And so let me ask you this question here for just a second, okay? Who in your life do you look at who doesn't have a relationship with Jesus and you just kind of give up on them? You know, look, you look at them and you're just kind of like, ah, yeah, you know what? They're never going to come to Jesus. And so I'm not going I'm, I'm to share him. I mean, I'm not even going to waste my time. I'm not going to waste my breath. I mean, if there's anything that we learn here, Luke chapter 2 from the shepherds as they're face to face with Jesus. If there's anything that we learn here, it's this. From day one, Jesus is for everyone. He's for everyone. And the issue is not whether or not they're good enough for Jesus. The issue is that Jesus is for them. The issue is that they can come face to face with Jesus. The issue is that one day their knee is going to bow, right, like we just talked about, and their tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. He is for everyone. Even the angel tells this to the shepherds in Luke 2. Look at verse 10. We looked at this last week, but I want to look at it again just real quick. The angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. I've got good news for all the people. He is for everyone. Everyone has an opportunity to be face to face with Jesus. And so after these shepherds show up and they're face to face, face to face with Jesus, what do these shepherds do? I mean, do the shepherds walk in and they say, oh, Joseph and Mary, what a cute little boy. He must be everything you've ever dreamed of. He's the savior of the world. Do they go in there and they, they find baby Jesus there in the manger and they're like, Gucci, Gucci, goo. Where's the Savior? There he is. <laughs> right? Where's the Messiah of the world? There he is. I'm just practicing for when I become a grandpa in May. <clears throat> That's all. Not that my grandchild's the Savior of the world. That didn't come out exactly right. But do the shepherds do that? And then they go back to the fields and they just start watching their sheep again? No. They understood the moment. They understood what was happening. And they just couldn't help but go and tell everyone what they had witnessed. They understood that they were at the cradle of the Savior of the world. And so they told everyone. They told everyone about what the angel had said. They told everyone about this army of angels that shows up praising God. They told everyone about the baby that they had found in the manger wrapped in cloths. They told everyone about what God had done. They told everyone about what God had done. You know, do me a favor for a second. Just put aside telling someone else about Jesus. Set that off to the side for just a second. When was the last time that you told someone about something that God was doing in your life? Psalm 145. The Bible says, One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. Do you tell of God's mighty acts in your life? Do you speak of his, aw of his awesome deeds? And his glorious splendor and his wonderful works. Do you celebrate his abundant goodness and joyfully sing of his righteousness? I mean, this is what the shepherds did. They just couldn't hold it in. There was no way that these guys were not going to tell others about what they were witnessing. And the reason why I love this part of the text so much is because you have these guys, these shepherds, these, these guys who are the lowest of the lower class, they're dirty they smell, nobody trusts them. And so you have these guys who can't even give testimony in a court of law. And they leave the manger scene and they give testimony about Jesus. 
And I think what I love so much about this text is, is that Luke makes sure to point out that everyone who heard what the shepherds were saying, they were amazed. No one was ever amazed by shepherds back in Jesus' day. Testify in a court of law? Nope. Testify about Jesus? Yep. And everyone is amazed. You know what I think? I think if God can use shepherds, then he can certainly use you. And I think if God wants to use shepherds, then he certainly wants to use you. And I think if people can be amazed by the Jesus story of shepherds, they can be amazed by your Jesus story. Telling your Jesus story, spreading the word, will help you see Jesus because you're looking at what he's done in your life. You're just telling your story. You're telling the good news of Jesus. Look at what Jesus says. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now, we've talked about this in here before. That word for gospel in the New Testament simply means good news. Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. I mean, this is what Jesus wants all of us to do. He wants us to go and share the good news, share our Jesus story with the people around us. You know, part of our vision here at RCC is to bring hope, freedom, and purpose to our local and global community. And our community right now needs Jesus more than ever. Our community needs a group of people who are willing to preach the good news. Our community needs a group of people. Our community needs you to be willing to share your Jesus story with them. They need you to tell them about God's mighty acts, to speak of his glorious splendor and his great deeds. And so the question is, will that be us? Will that be you? And so let me just give you something that will help you to begin to tell your Jesus story. This, this Friday afternoon, evening, we've got two Christmas Eve services at 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock, and I hope that you are planning to be here. I hope you're planning to join us for those services. And so what I want to encourage you to do is you can go to the table at the back of the, the, one of the two tables at the back of the room where the giving boxes are, and we've got these cards on the table there. And these are just simple cards that you can give to your family members, to your friends, to your neighbors, inviting them to our Christmas Eve services uh, this Friday. And so just grab some of those cards on your way out, hand those cards to your friends, to your family members, whoever it is that you would like to invite to be here with you, and then be here with them, and let us start the Jesus story, and then you can take over and finish it from there. And so stop by one of those tables on your way out today, and grab one of those cards, and invite some folks to be with you, and we can just spread the word because we see Jesus and what he's doing in our lives. And then let's finish off this Christmas series with this. Let's praise him. I love how our text ends for us this morning. Look at verse 20. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. And so you've got these shepherds that end up being face-to-face with Jesus. And once they go and they spread the word, Luke says that they go back and they're praising God. They're praising God because everything had happened exactly the way that God said it was going to happen. And so, friends, we have to come to this conclusion that Jesus lying there in the manger is real. That Jesus going to the cross and giving his life for us is real. It's not a fake. And because he is real, and because he gave his life, because he came to save his people from their sins, we can praise him. We can praise him in the good times and in the bad times. And I think if we're not careful, we can allow the things that happen to us in life to determine whether or not we praise him. But because he is real and because things happen exactly the way that God said they would happen, we have an opportunity to praise him regardless of what we're going through in life. This is what we're learning right now as a family. As my wife Marianne begins this new cancer, uh, this new journey with her cancer, and as we begin this journey with with her, one of the things that we have talked about as a family is that we are not going to allow what we're going through to determine our praise to God. Because even in the midst of that, there's much to be thankful for, right? Even in the midst of that, there's still much to praise Him for. So many blessings that He has given to us. So many ways that He's working and moving in us and in our family. And we're not going to allow what is happening to us determine our praise to Him because it's not about cancer, it's about Jesus. I have a dear friend. A couple of weeks ago, we 
when I shared with you for the first time what was going on with Marianne, he came up to me after one of the services. He's battled cancer three times himself. And he just kind of put his hand on my shoulder and he said, Brad, I want you to always remember it's not about little C cancer, it's about big C Christ. And you know what? He's right. You look in the Old Testament in the book of Psalms, all sorts of instructions for us to praise him. Psalm 150 says, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Psalm 115 says, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. Psalm 95 says, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. Psalm 69, I will praise God's name in song and glorify him with thanksgiving. Psalm 105, give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. And then you've got Psalm 150, probably my favorite psalm. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. And we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. So many instructions for us to praise Him. You know, during this time of the year, we often focus on the things that we don't have, right? Like we've made our Christmas list, and kids have made their Christmas list, the grandkids have made their Christmas list, and we put things on our lists that we don't have. I mean, what's the, what's the purpose of putting something on your Christmas list that you already have, right? So we focus on all these things that we don't have. Now, I will tell you this, there's one exception to that rule, and it's on my Christmas list, because on my Christmas list, I have new fishing reels and rods, and I've already got several of those, but you can never have enough. You can never have too many. But we focus on all these things that we don't have. So let me just, can I just give you this encouragement and this challenge as we finish off this series? Leading up to Saturday, this week, can we just focus on what we do have? Can we focus on what we do have and just spend some time just praising Him? You have a Father who has made you and loves you. You have a God who's shown up for you time and time again. You have a Lord who is the great God. He's the great King above all gods. You can praise Him for His acts of power and for His greatness. You can praise Him for His love and faithfulness. You can praise Him because you are His. And so let's focus on what we do have, and let's just praise Him. You know, I think maybe every year I give you the same encouragement, and so I can't, I can't let this Christmas series end without giving you this encouragement again this year. But at some point in time, Friday or Saturday, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, at some point in time, would you just gather together as a family and somebody grab a Bible and open it up to Luke chapter 2, and just read the first 20 verses that we've studied together this morning. Before all the festivities begin and before all the busyness, I mean, my wife Mary and I, we've been married for 28 years, so we've done this together for 28 Christmases, and now we do this on Christmas Eve night right before our kids go to bed. We just grab a Bible, and either myself or Mary one of the kids, we read from Luke chapter 2, we read those first 20 verses, and we just spend some time focusing on what we have the Savior of the world, the Messiah that was born to us. And so let's just praise Him. Would you stand with me, please? You know, I said just a moment ago that eventually every knee is going to bow and every tongue will acknowledge, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so I want to give you an opportunity to not miss that opportunity this morning. And so we're going to sing here in just a moment. And while we're singing, if you want to surrender your heart and life to Christ, you want to bow before him now and you want to acknowledge now that he is your Savior and Lord, or maybe you've got questions about what that means 
Would you just make your way to the cross at the back of the room while we sing? And we'll take some time and we'll talk this morning. Now, here's the thing about all this, okay? Jesus will not force his way into your life. Now, you invite him in and that's a different story, right? You invite him in and that's the start of your story. That's the start of your story with Jesus. And so I'm going to be at the cross at the back of the room. And I'd love to spend some time with you this morning just talking through that. Maybe you have carried something in here this morning. Maybe you're on a new journey and it's heavy. And you have an opportunity this morning to just hurry off and go to Jesus and just say, Jesus, I can't do this anymore. I need you right now. You can do that where you're standing while we sing. If you want to make your way to the cross and talk, we'll pray together. Be happy to do that too. Maybe you've got somebody in mind, somebody that you know needs to be face-to-face with Jesus. And you have an opportunity to just tell them about Jesus. You have an opportunity to share your story of Jesus with them. Just pray for that person while we sing. You, you know who that person is. And so just pray for that person. and Ask God for them to have an open heart, an open mind, for an opportunity for you to share that message. A chance to share the good news with them. Maybe while we sing together, you just focus on what you have. You have a Savior who's been born to you. From day one, we're told, when when the angel shows up in the dream with Joseph, you will call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And so maybe while we sing, you just take a moment to praise him and to say thank you. So let's pray together, and then we're going to sing this morning. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you, Father, that he came in that manger all those years ago, ultimately to give his life. And so we thank you, Father, for the hope of eternal life. We thank you, Father, that it doesn't end there. The story does not end there. That's just the beginning. We thank you, Father, that as we live day after day after day, We have this opportunity to just hurry off and go to Jesus. Father, some of us, maybe we stand here this morning and we are tired. We are worn out. We are overwhelmed. We are broken. We feel helpless. We've tried to do this in our own strength. We've tried to stand our own ground. We've tried to control everything, and maybe we're at the point where we realize we can't do it anymore. And so, Father, may we just hurry off this morning. Just go to Jesus. We thank you, Father, for all these relationships that you give to us, for the people that we come in contact with, some of those people who need to know Jesus. Father, use us in a powerful way to share our story of Jesus with them. And Father, we thank you for who you are, for your goodness to us. We thank you, Father, for the way that you work in our lives. We thank you for the way that you have shown up for us time and time again. We thank you, Father, for your righteousness, for your good deeds, for your mighty works and your mighty acts in our lives. May we take a moment this morning to just praise you. Father, if there's someone here who needs a relationship with you through Jesus, give them the courage to take the first step this morning. That they may have that hope of eternal life. That they may invite your son Jesus into their heart and into their life. Father, we thank you that you love us. Thank you for sending Jesus for us. We just praise you for who you are and for what you've done for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name.